good to see everyone out. We have a number of our regular members who are traveling. It's that time of the year when people are on vacations. And we hope they have uh, safe trips and safe trip back home. We have a number of visitors with us today, and for you, we are thankful. What I have to deal with today is having to do much with the Spring Church members. It is certainly a sermon, but it also reveals some decisions that the elders have made regarding the church. Those of you who were here this past Wednesday, and I may pause here and interject, I don't want to dwell on to the point of embarrassment as far as Brother Ralph Fisher is concerned, but we all heard him deliver a good, needful, and timely message during the Spring Church's midweek Bible study. Now, those of you who heard him and listened to really what he said, you'll recall that he emphasized that Christians are taught in the New Testament to depend on one another to help them live lives faithful to the Lord. Really, you can sum all of that up in as a part of being in fellowship with God and in fellowship one with another. Christians are able and ought to know the spiritual state of their brethren. We can't know people's hearts like Jesus did. But Jesus has taught us how to recognize when somebody is what he ought to be and what he ought not be. Because he talked about, by their fruits ye shall know them. These uh, fruits, if you please, will testify as to whether one is spiritually strong or weak, faithful or unfaithful to the Lord. Matthew 7, 20. In fact, if you read through the New Testament, you'll find a number of passages that talk about Christians bearing good fruit. And we have to know what the Bible means by good fruit. So we know there's fruit to be born and God calls it good. If you live contrary to the teaching of the Bible, you're not going to routinely and habitually and steadfastly with regularity bring forth good fruit. This has to do with fruit brought forth because one is faithful to God. One is doing what God says people ought to do. They're being Christians in their everyday activity. 1 Corinthians 9.10, Philippians 1.11, James 3.17. You might want to jot these down. They make it clear that this is part of our being faithful wherever we are. Brother Fisher made it very clear as to how concerned he is about his own salvation. I don't know, but have you noticed over the years, I say I don't know, I don't know how many think this way. How many people have you heard, your brothers and sisters in Christ, however old you are and how long you've been faithful, that have said to their other spiritual family members, I'm really concerned about my soul. I want everybody that can to help me be as faithful to God as I can be. And I want to help them to be as faithful to God as they can be. I've never heard talk like that too much. Yet it ought to be falling from the lips of every one of us and our various capacities of service to the Lord. After all, we talk a lot about, and Jesus talks a lot about, being of service to others. Everything about a Christian is being, of, first of all, service to God. Faithfully serving Him. That means according to His will. And then we are to serve one another. And if part of that service is not to help each other, as a part of our fellowship in Christ as brothers and sisters, to be strong in the Lord, then... I don't know what being in fellowship with one another entails. He pointed out that he is, as I say, Christians, all Christians ought to be. He's so concerned for his soul's salvation that he wants his brethren to point out to him anything they see in his life that is sinful. Do you think that way about yourself? Do I think that way about myself? Well, I've lived my life trying to do that. Of course, it ought to begin with each one of us doing that to ourselves in the light of the Bible we study daily and in praying to God daily. Think of the song we just sung. 
Of course, this also means we then are to be busy about encouraging faithful brethren in their good works. We don't know what a good work is from God's perspective if we don't know what the Bible teaches Christians are to be about. So when I say good works, naturally I'm referring to that which the New Testament labels as good, that is singular to those who are members of the church. We ought to be doing our best to encourage and to show forth the importance of each one giving forth spiritual sacrifices in their time, in their several abilities or their talents, and in their money. We often quote 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, not just doing, but abounding, running over, abounding in the work of the Lord. That's how you bear the fruit that Paul talked about. But if you run your references, and here's only a few, you'll see the Bible's full of material that talks about how we're to be busy in good works as the New Testament defines those good works. Ephesians 2.10, Titus 2.14, Chapter 3.14 and 1 Peter 2.12. Those are just a few as I say. Whatever the case, brethren can and ought to be aware of the lives that their brethren are leading. Let me say that again. Brethren ought to be aware of the lives their brethren are leading. What they do and what they do not. And all for one reason. Because we want to help each other go to heaven. Can you tell me of what worth I am to you finally and ultimately? And what worth you are to me and each to one another if we're not here to help each other be faithful? Because that's another way you're going to go to heaven. Everything you read in your Bible has to do with each other encouraging one another. And you'll also find it has to do with when you see a uh, brother trespass that you're not just say well I love him so much I let him stay in the trespass you know some people do wrong not meaning to do wrong but they still do it anyway and they need to have it pointed out just as we need to encourage one another in doing what we know is right surely we don't think I know we wouldn't say so but maybe we do really think that once you obey the gospel you ought to be left alone and do as you please well I'd do that I wouldn't preach this sermon if you will bring your New Testament and show me where that sentiment is taught. When you notice Paul's statement to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11, he did not hesitate to say, you have known my manner of life. He even went into detail of the persecutions and so forth and all that he did because of his faithful service to God. He says, now that was a pattern for you to follow. That raises a question to me. And therefore, I raise that question to you. Is your life, is my life, a pattern of godly living for other people to follow? In other words, let's get plain. Is your pattern of attendance the way you want every other member to attend? Let's give it even more intimate. Is your pattern of attendance at the worship and Bible study like you want your children to live when they're grown and on their own? Is that godliness? Is that getting them ready for heaven? We can ask that about your Bible study and the Bible study classes of the church. We can ask that about what you know about the Bible says prayer, a song we sang a moment ago, emphasize that greatly. Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? We often mention that in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we're to make our requests made known to God. We're to pray without ceasing, always being in a relationship with God where we can speak to Him. That's what that means, and we want to. All those things have to do with me helping me to do what my duty is, and me helping you and you're helping me in our various capacities. Now, is your life a help to your brothers and sisters? Is it an encouragement for them to spend time in Bible study and prayer and worship? If it is, we want to encourage you in it. We exhort you to keep on keeping on. That's being steadfast. Paul wrote, and sometimes we forget this, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Romans 14, 7 and 8. 
Does that permeate your mind all day long every day? And causing you to think about what kind of life you're to live. We mentioned in class this morning, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that there's to be our bodies presented to God as living sacrifices. And under the Old Testament economy, they offered dead sacrifices. They offered the best they had as the law instructed. And in those sacrifices, they were to be mindful that a, an innocent being died because they sinned. And it pointed them to the death of Christ on the cross, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Well, in Christ, as brothers and sisters, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, are we helping one another because we all belong to the Lord? We all have the same Savior. We all have the same Bible and the same New Testament. We all have the same church purchased by the precious blood of Christ, Acts 20 and 28. We're all cleansed by the same blood when we were baptized into Christ in, into the church, if you please. And that blood continues to cleanse us as we're faithful to Him. As we are faithful to Him, it cleanses us. Brother Fisher specifically asked his audience, his brethren in the Lord, if he could depend on them to help him live a righteous life. We sometimes sing a song, and it's aimed at God, or Christ, really, our relationship to Christ. Can he, Christ, depend on you? Can he depend on you? Well, that's a good question. Husbands, can you depend upon your wife to be what the Bible says a wife ought to be to you? And wives, can you depend upon your husband that he'll be to you what the New Testament says? Can your children depend upon you, according to the Bible's teaching, to be parents to them? And can we as brothers and sisters in God's family depend upon one another to be helped to go to heaven? And then ask yourself the question, if we can't do those things, really of what worth are we and who do we really serve? He said among men, that is, Brother Fisher. If he could not depend on his brethren in Christ to help him be faithful, on whom could he depend to help him be faithful? Well, you ask yourself that question. If you can't depend upon the Lord's church, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to help you serve him faithfully, then uh, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go to find that strength? Among men, of course. Among men. Well, that's an attitude we all need to cultivate. It's what's called a humble attitude that says, I need help. You know, and I'm going to preach a sermon on this for too long because it kind of fits in along this line. We had our lectureship this year on the seven churches of Asia. But have you ever really studied closely the church at Laodicea? The biggest problem that church has is that we don't need anybody. Self-complacency. I'm making it just fine. I don't need anything else. What nation are we citizens of? And what is the general attitude among so many people in this nation? We're rich and we have needed nothing. And even the poorest of the poor have far more than the poor people of other places. So we need an attitude that says, I can't make it without God's system. And God's system includes the church of the living God, of which we are members if we have obeyed the gospel, if we're in Christ. Now, what do I contribute to the church? And to be more specifically, since there's no larger or smaller organized entity of the worldwide church of the living God, the one church that Jesus built, than the congregation in any geographic location, such as the church at Spring, what difference are you making to your brethren here in the church at Spring toward helping them be faithful? The example you set, the work you do, and you can go on through there. But you see this attitude even in the Apostle Paul when he was concerned after having preached to others, he would be a castaway. So he said that he buffeted his body and brought it under subjection. Last, after preaching to others, he was a castaway. Now that's humility. And yet we think how great Paul was in his fearless proclamation in defense of the gospel and his daily living for the Lord. He even said it himself, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, in the light of the truth of the New Testament, 
And I certainly didn't know what Brother Fisher was going to speak on last week. I don't think anybody else did here but God and him. But it served as a great launching point. Uh, maybe it encouraged him and everybody else to see that sometimes you hit the nail right on the head. And though while you intended to teach a good lesson, maybe, maybe sometimes, who knows, but that thou hast come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I know that if we're faithful every day, we'll be what we ought to be to the kingdom, whatever time it is. But in the light of what he said and what the Bible certainly teaches, we need to be reminded that in general, the church, the saved from sin among all the earth, the kingdom of God, God's children, is obligated to God, ultimately and finally, directly and indirectly, to save souls. Every single solitary thing, the church of our Lord, each one of us as Christians in seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness do is having to do with saving souls. Now how does the church do that? The church saves souls. Individual Christians seeking to save that which is lost does so through the proclamation of the gospel, teaching the word of God to the alien sinner, the one outside of Christ, the one who's not a Christian. Edifying, which we've been already talking about, building up spiritually one's brothers and sisters in Christ. And in practicing benevolence, helping those who can't help themselves. Mark 16, 15, and how many passages we could offer. The power is in the gospel. The gospel is in the New Testament. It's to be put into practice in your life and mine and our various capacities as we seek to save souls. Now, I've been amazed all my life somewhat, and I still am, of how people can work hard to get somebody converted to Christ. And we ought to. That's right. That's wholesome. That's commendable. And then when they become members of the Lord's church, we don't seem to think that as babes in Christ, they're not mature. The very fact the scripture says they're babes in Christ. Oh, they may be 40 years old chronologically, but babes in Christ. Some are going to know more than others. That's true. But they still must grow. They still must develop. And that growing and developing takes place in Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you can't grow in Christ. The growth is in Christ. And one, having believed in Christ based upon the evidence in the Scriptures, has faith, confidence, trust in Christ formed as the Savior, and nobody else is, Romans 10, 17. One is willing to turn away from all things contrary to His will in repentance, do it about faith, and start down the road the Lord lays out for you, Acts 17, 30. And is willing to confess Jesus Christ as a Son of God, and then be immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of past sins. And He will add you to His church. That's being baptized into Christ. If you haven't done that from the heart, you are not a Christian. So I'm speaking primarily today to those who have done that. Sometime in the past, you are in Christ. You are to help your brethren as best you can by a godly life to go to heaven. That's your purpose. It should be the purpose of every one of us. It's part of being in fellowship with one with another. Now, in view of the obligation laid on the church to save souls and how it does it, and once we are in Christ, we still have a duty one to another. In the New Testament's teaching regarding this church and its organization, then when a church is fully organized, it has elders, presbyters, bishops, pastors, they're not different. They're different terms talking about the different aspects of the work. The world makes a difference in their meaning. But the elders of the church are presbyters. They're bishops. They're pastors. And a preacher shouldn't be called a pastor, folks, unless he's an elder. That's just all there is to it. So they have an obligation to God. First of all, that must be a reality in every elder's mind, an obligation to God, even as it must be in a preacher or a deacon or any church member concerning the church, the Lord's church. But elders have an obligation no other member of the church has. Elders have been assigned the responsibility, the singular responsibility, of seeing that the church, each individual Christian, 
practices pure and undefiled religion. Is steadfastly discharging one's obligations to God as a Christian, doing it in the quickest and best way possible. James 1, 27, Acts 20 and 28, Galatians 5, 16 through 24, Hebrews 13, 7 and verse 17, and 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. It doesn't take long to take your concordance and, and find those passages. They're there. The meaning of them has been there since it was fully revealed. Faithful elders understand that in many cases there are various and different options from which they may choose, whereby the church may discharge its duty to save souls. And sometimes they have to think for a while to figure out what that best option is. And discharging a certain duty that is the obligation of the church involved in saving souls, which of course involves edification of one another. But nevertheless, that's the way the Lord said it ought to be. Of course, cooperation of all involved, regardless of our roles, is of paramount importance as we seek to do our duty to God. And the key is seeking to do our duty to God. It's very hard as members of the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, doing the Lord's work, to do our duty to God and not be doing our duty to one another. Part of the serious and sobering work of elders is to choose the option, I emphasize again, or option sometimes, that best expedites, that means the most advantageous one for the church to discharge its obligations to save souls. Different churches, according to several abilities of the members, etc., etc., determines what the elders will do as far as the decisions they make. It is as much a part of doing things decently and in order as any other activity of God's people. Colossians 3.17, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. You know, that also brings up in the family unit. There's the headship of the husband and the functioning of the wife to be submissive to him. She has a role. He should in his headship help her discharge her role and vice versa. We could study a lot more about that. Not that we haven't, but you always need to be reminded of those things. But don't you think a home to function as God wants it to be regarding the roles of parents and children, husband and wife, should be run decently and in order? Well, with the foregoing in mind, the spring elders are beginning an effort that will more easily, we trust, offer the spring members the opportunity to express themselves privately to the elders about anything pertaining to Christian living, especially having to do with their life. In view of the scriptural fact that the elders of the church are responsible to God for the souls of brethren under their watch care, the spring elders are going to schedule meetings with each member of the spring congregation. We're going to try monthly to do this in view of the size. And it will take place after the monthly meal. And we'll be meeting in family with family units where both husband and wife are Christians or if somebody is single, then we're going to meet in that way with them. And if a matter arises requiring more time to discuss whatever may be on the minds of any member, then a later time can be scheduled if that needs to happen. Or, you know, you're always welcome to meet with the elders. And that's what the eldership at Spring wants every member to know, is that you're always welcome to meet with them, to express your thoughts on things. But we want to make this a regular thing. And we hope that you'll cooperate with us. Now, please understand that this is an effort of the Spring eldership to visit the membership and vice versa in a private setting in an orderly fashion about whatever concerns any of you as spring members regarding the matter of living the Christian life, your own life personally, your family, or whatever else. We want to make this a routine effort in the hopes that members will always feel at ease in speaking with and discussing matters with the shepherds of the flock. It is the wish, a very strong wish, and prayer of the spring elders that the congregation will work with us as we labor to shepherd the spring flock of God 
with concern for God's will being done. The church discharging its obligation. Each one helping the other to go to heaven as brothers and sisters in Christ. It was so well articulated in Wednesday night's lesson. That it would help us in our lives be more faithful to God. Be of better service to God. It will help cooperation through communication. That's so very important. So we covet your prayers. Strongly covet your prayers as we labor together to help each other go to heaven when our lives on earth are finished. Now there's one other thing I want to mention that is going on too to help in this area. We have for a long time had attendance charts for our worship assemblies and Bible classes. They've been kept. But we haven't utilized them always as far as knowing who's where and so on, who's in attendance and who's not. So we want to start being more particular about noticing who's in attendance. I don't want us, and I'm saying this as a Christian, and what I've said all my life as a gospel preacher, to get to the point where we think the worship assemblies, you know, we can take it or leave it. Uh, we can find about any excuse to be somewhere else. We can just be busy all day Saturday and we're just not really able to be here for a couple hours on Sunday morning or whatever in the afternoon. Now that's just not, nothing in the New Testament teaches such an attitude as that among those who are of Christ, Christians, members of the church. So we want to start being particular on noticing who is absent. We want to try to find out why. If the elders of the church don't have that obligation as shepherds of the flock to find out what the members are up to, to put it nicely, whether it's good things, we encourage you in those things, whether it's things you need help in or maybe just completely absenting yourself. I know that the way to, to apostasy tends to start showing up publicly when people start missing services. And then finally they don't come at all. Well, we want to do something about that, and we'll be watching that and seeing what people are doing. Again, we covet your prayers. Our prayers are for you. We're here to serve one another in the various capacities of which we're in the Lord's church. Think for a minute. Why would anybody want to do anything like I said this morning and not be doing it to help brethren be strong in the Lord that heaven will be our home. The only people in heaven, as far as the church is concerned, since it's been in existence, are going to be the faithful of the church. Thus, we ought to be helping each other to be faithful, to be concerned, to be reminded, to be encouraged, if needful, to be exhorted and rebuked. It's all part of loving one another and of being in fellowship with one another. So I hope what we said this morning has not only been a sermon that needs to be preached to every Christian throughout life, but specifically for the spring congregation is what we want to try to do as elders and have your cooperation helping us do it. And then I'll end where, where I actually started. When Peter was writing and he mentions the end of the world, he says this in 2 Peter 3 in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, how did the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter writing to Christians say this should benefit us? Because this is written to Christians, you know. Here's how he says it helps us. Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation? Conversation there meaning the old King James, your conduct. The way you live. What manner of persons ought you to be in your dedicated holy life and godliness? If everything that comes from this pulpit in every Bible class and your whole reason to study the Bible is not, desired, not designed to get you ready to meet your Lord in the judgment, if our association with one another is not designed to make us live lives and encourage us to live lives that are holy and righteous, seeing they're the only ones who are going to go to heaven, then why am I here? 
And what are you worth? And what am I worth to any other brother or sister in Christ? If you're not a child of God this morning, there's where you need to begin. Because you're outside of Christ, still in your sins. You're lost. You can't go to heaven. We've studied the plan of salvation. If you will, from the heart, obey that and live your life in the church to which the Lord will add you to, you'll go to heaven. As a child of God, what is your life? Is it truly of Christ? Is it lived with the idea that I want to live such a life to help my brethren be faithful and they help me be faithful? If you have committed any kind of sins and you may know and nobody else knows but God, then the second law of pardon is for you to humbly repent of those sins, confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. Now we always offer an invitation. Some people have stopped that in some places. I don't know why, since we're here to save souls. But it may be that there's here that one needs to obey the gospel. It may be that you as a child of God have sinned. You need to do uh, corrections in your life by repenting and confessing and praying God for forgiveness. So the Lord stands ready and waiting. His arms are still outstretched, saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So if you're subject to the blessed invitation of Jesus Christ, will you come while we stand and sing?